What's going on, buddy? My name is Elprin, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. Today, I got a little bit of something different in terms of history. If you guys know, I've been watching, watching a lot of Thomas the Train stuff lately on my channel. And something has always caught my mind in terms of history. <clears throat> and I've only read a little bit about this subject, and I don't know very much about it. We're going to be looking at British Rail history, the modernization plan that took place after World War II. And the... Uh, finalization of British Railway. And I do not ha know how to pronounce this guy's name, so I'm just going to put it right here so you guys can see it. I fortunately don't know how to pronounce your channel name, my friend, so I'm sorry. So I'm not even, I'm not even going to try and attempt and butcher it. But if you have, are watching this video, please get in contact with me. Let me know how to pronounce it. And I'll pronounce it better next time in a future video if I find one. Um... And if you guys enjoy today's reaction video, please let me know in the comment section and I will definitely check out more videos for you guys in the future. It, regarding railways too, I love railways. I want to go back to Strasbourg in Pennsylvania for a, like, a, like a weekend and just go back on the trains. I'm a huge train fanatic, <laughs> if it wasn't obvious by the time of the train videos I've been making as of late. But <clears throat> I don't know why my throat's bothering me a little bit. But with that being said, guys, we're just going to go right into this. This is why the British Rail Modernization Plan failed. I don't know a lot about it. All I know is that it was implemented and it failed. That's it. I don't know many causes behind it. I know it has to do with faulty singles, wiring, failed electronics, stuff like that. That's just about it. I don't know the whole political side behind it. So with that being said, we're going to go right into today's video in three, two, one, go. Motion history. In the 1950s, the newly formed British Railways prepared to undertake a highly ambitious plan to revolutionise the nation's war-torn network in order to make it suitable for the 20th century, investing millions of pounds to introduce a widespread refurbishment of the infrastructure, operations and rolling stock of the country. Sadly, what would later be known as the Modernisation Plan of 1955 only accomplished a small number of its objectives, and by the end of the plan period, the UK rail network would be both much smaller and laden with more debts and corporate inefficiency than ever before. British Railways was formed on January 1st, 1948, as part of the Transport Act of 1947, wherein the bankrupt, battle-weary Big Four railway companies, the London and North Eastern Railway, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, the Great Western Railway, and the Southern Railway, were merged by the government, also known as the Big Four, to form a single <coughs> nationalised operator, while cash injections needed to rebuild the system would be done by direct state funding. The operation of British Railways fell under the Railway Executive of the British Transport Commission, or BTC, an arm of the government. Uh, I might be the only one personally saying this, but do British trains look beautiful compared to other uh, nations' uh, style of trains? I, I, I've always had a massive fascination with British trains, more so than American ones. American ones, I can understand, but the British ones look so much better like in terms of their style i know i know it's gonna sound a little weird but that's just how i feel on the matter that was tasked with rebuilding and revitalizing the road railway and canal networks of the uk and it was during this period that two plans were considered british railways as an organization comprised of managers and staff of railway background <coughs> proposed that a comprehensive plan should be undertaken to modernize well. the network to make it comparable to the european rail systems including major infrastructural rebuilds to iron out curves, while also introducing widespread electric and diesel traction. In the wake of World War II, the rail networks of France, Germany, Holland and Belgium had been largely destroyed by vicious land battles and aerial bombardments, thus allowing each rail operator a blank canvas on which to rebuild their systems to a far more efficient blueprint than what had come previously. Although Britain's network had been damaged by air raids and was worn out after years of neglect, the general structure was still very much intact, therefore it would have cost much more to decommission, remove and rebuild existing sections of the operational permanent way in order to smooth curves and increase speeds. To this end, the BTC proposed instead the introduction of a fleet of new higher efficiency steam locomotives that would act as interim measures before eventually bringing forward widespread diesel traction and limited electrification. Here's another thing I know about the modernization failure. It had to do with the whole massive uh, diesel fleet. It's like they were putting out so much money in ter for the diesels that weren't even ready to be sent out, like weren't even completely tested. And they just kept failing repetitively, which is why, from what I remember, 
diesels being very hated during the early years of, years of the British ra British Railway. A more <coughs> cost-effective method, but one that would leave many of the previous infrastructural issues in place. In 1951, BTC pushed forward the plan for a brand new fleet of steam engines, resulting in the BR standard series of locomotives, which, while among the most efficient steam engines ever built, were ultimately a needless stopgap that would only work for less than half their expected operational lifespan. That's another thing, dude. The steam engines that were still really good were v scrapped very early on, even though they could have been used for the, their entire lifespan. I know prices are a thing, but if you build a machine and you don't intend to use it to the full extent, don't build it. The only <laughs> other initial modernization undertaken during that the class first 40? decade of BR's existence were previous initiatives proposed by the Big Four including the introduction of early diesel prototypes by the LMS on the Midland Main Line out of yeah, London's class Pankers, 40. and the electrification of the Woodhead route between Sheffield, Wath and Manchester. I know very few volts DC classes. Overhead wires. <clears throat> As for the wider network, British Railways did start the 1950s making a marginal working profit, but with the rise of domestic air travel on long-distance services and highly convenient car travel on regional journeys, the company began to lose its customer base this impact being felt especially on the branch lines of rural England, Scotland and Wales, which had held a monopoly on their respective markets since they'd replaced the horse and cart over a century earlier. In 1954, the UK government, seeing the losses being made by British Railways, demanded an investigation be made in order to determine how the situation could be remedied, and in December of that year, a report named The Modernisation and Reequipment of the British Railways was published, the intentions of the plan being to bring the railway system up to date, followed two years later by a government white paper that stated the modernization plan would eliminate BR's financial deficit by 1962. The most important aspects of the modernization plan were to increase speed, reliability... I forgot the name of the class for that steam engine, but I just really love how pretty it is. ...safety <clears throat> and line capacity, while also making sure that the image of the railway was improved in order to reinvigorate interest in train travel, with the plan proposing a total projected cost of £1.24 million, pounds, Silver Fox, that's approximately £29 billion pounds in 2020. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of the money. The essential objectives of the plan were to electrify the principal mainline routes out of London, including the East Coast Main Line, West Coast Main Line, and South Eastern Main Line, to replace steam with diesel traction, to introduce new passenger and freight stock, to re-signal and renew the existing track work, to close branch lines which are either loss-making or duplicated other, more efficient lines, and to create a series of marshalling yards in order to organise wagon load freight operations more economically. The problem was, however, that the modernisation plan was based on a large series of compromises, while also failing to understand the changing trends in both passenger and freight conveyance. The first issue was that the previously considered comprehensive rebuild of the network to iron out corners and improve speeds was dropped, meaning that all the modernisation plan would do is dress up the existing Victorian era infrastructure with new traction and signals, while failing to address the main problems that slowed trains down. What well, were the issues? Secondly, the original BR plans to electrify all main lines out of London, including the lines west to Bristol and Cardiff, north to Leicester, Derby and Nottingham, and east to Ipswich and Norwich, were abandoned, with electrification focusing instead on only three lines. Okay, I didn't know electrification was introduced this early on. I thought it would be like introduced in like the 70s or something, not like... Late 50s, mid 60s, I didn't think it was that early. The West Coast Main Line to Birmingham, Manchester and Liverpool, the East Coast Main Line to Leeds and York, and the South Eastern Main Line to Dover. In the end, only two of these three routes would be delivered under the modernisation plan, the East Coast Main Line electrification being dropped due to the cost of having to rebuild the roof at King's Cross Station in order to accommodate King's the complex Cross. overhead like gantries, while the West Coast Main Line was electrified as far as Liverpool between 1959 and 1965, and the southeastern main line was electrified between 1957 and 1961. Next was the introduction of brand new rolling stock for both freight and passenger operations, as older, wooden-bodied carriages from the Big Four era, as well as the original Mark I coach of 1951, were replaced from 1964 by the steel-bodied Mark II coach, a requirement following the Harrow and Wheelstone disaster, when during a collision of three fully laden Whoa. passenger trains on the morning of October 8, 1952, 112 people were killed, in what was the worst peacetime railway disaster in British history. The I gotta look into that. Primary cause for deaths in the accident being the fragility of the wooden bodied rolling stock. Yeah, because it's made out of wood, so it'll break a lot easier in a crash. I mean, there was, the, there was that big train crash in 1916, I think it was. It was during World War II. It was a big British rail accident. 
for the military. I think over 140 something people died. I, I watched that a little uh, like two, like a year ago. I gotta rewatch it again and make sure. I think that I may have been off a little bit on the on the casualties, but I know it's somewhere around that area. Eight older <laughs> wooden bodied wagons would be replaced by steel bodied equivalents, while a new series of higher capacity hopper wagons, tankers, flatbeds, and goods vans would improve both the strength of these vehicles while also reducing maintenance costs. But many of these were made redundant as the need for wagon load freight was replaced by new systems of conveying goods. This leads to the next there. issue, the creation of multiple vast marshalling yards across the UK in order to improve the efficiency of forming and splitting wagon load freight trains that had originated with a variety of different private and government customers, the most notable of which were mixed traffic freights that would have- Are they applying- I'm sorry, I need to go back and listen to what he was saying, but I'm, I'm just trying to pay attention to see what these guys are doing. I've never truly seen work like this. I gotta go watch some older railroad road, um, documentaries of how operations like this were done. I was just distracted by this. I'm sorry. I gotta go back. This leads to the next issue, the creation of multiple vast marshalling yards across the UK in order to improve the efficiency of forming and splitting wagon load freight trains that had originated with a variety of different private and government customers, the most notable of which were mixed traffic freights that would have individual wagons owned by said customers. To suit a demand BR perceived to be flourishing, Marshalling yards of up to 30 tracks were either introduced or expanded at a variety of strategic locations, including Tinsley, Seven Tunnel Junction, Cadder, and Healy Mills, complemented by a huge fleet of diesel shunters such as the Class 08. I was about to say Class 08. Unfortunately, BR had completely misread the growing trend for containerized shipping during the late 1950s and early 1960s, meaning that the need for wagon load freight was now being replaced by block trains that had no need to split or be formed at marshalling yards to serve I did not think crate uh crate crate trains were being introduced that early on it that 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 is a big tongue twister <laughs> for customers rendering most of these facilities obsolete within years of their opening compounded further by br being legally bound to its status as a common carrier wherein it was obliged to provide carriage for virtually any type of goods regardless of quantity large or small between any two stations on the network at set and published rates while road hauliers and trucking companies had no such legal restrictions and could therefore both undercut the railway's rates and turn down work that was yeah. uneconomic. The road's way of carrying things and the, and the railway's way of carrying cargo were completely different. On the subject of introducing new <clears throat> locomotives, BR intended the large-scale introduction of diesel traction to replace steam, with a total of 2,500 locomotives for mainline service to be procured in 10 years at a cost of £125 Gee, million, pounds, is... or £3 billion pounds in 2020, together with the aforementioned replacement of rolling stock at a cost of £285 million, pounds, or £6.8 billion in 2020, with long-term aspirations being to electrify all trunk routes that would be operated by 1,100 electric locomotives at a cost of £60 million, pounds, or £1.4 billion in 2020, plus an additional £125 million pounds for electric infrastructure, or two... Could just talk about that money for a second there? That is so much money just to make it over 2,000 types of diesels in 10 years. Well, half the money didn't even end up being wasted because half of the units, they, types of diesels they were making were just failing on the spot. 2.8 billion in 2020. While the concept was sound, the execution was problematic with the transition from steam to diesel being sharp and uncompromising, with all active steam locomotives, regardless of their age, required to be withdrawn by August 1968, including the then brand new BR standard locomotives, which had only between 4 and 12 years of work under their belts by the time this date came to pass, even though they had been designed to operate until as late as the 1980s. Next was the ordering of 174 diesel locomotive classes from six independent manufacturers by British Railways, the choice of so many builders being due to political pressure to keep the workforce of certain constituencies employed, regardless of their lack of experience when building diesel locomotives, while BR's design offices stipulated a requirement for three different power categories that would fulfill the needs of its mainline operations, these being known as types. Type 1s being locomotives of less than 1,000 horsepower, Type 2s being of less than 1,500 horsepower, and Type 3 being of less than 2,000 horsepower, but this was later expanded to Type 4 for locomotives with less than 3,000 horsepower, and Type 5 for locomotives with more than 3,000 horsepower. Eesh. The problem was that BR chose to have diesel locomotives replace steam locomotives on a like-for-like -like basis, with up to five different classes of diesel locomotive per power category that comprised a substantial fleet of engines, 
while also representing diverse engineering designs <coughs> that range from their type of transmission, to their engine size, to their operational speed. The purpose being to determine the most successful design elements that would ultimately form longer term large scale orders. What resulted were seven Type 1 classes, including the Class 14, Class 15, Class 16, Class 17 and Class 20, as well as some Class 21s and 22s, 10 Type 2 classes, including some Class 21s and 22s, Class 23s, 24s, 25s, 26s, 27s, 28s, 29s and 31s, 3 Type 3 classes, including Class 33s, 35s and 37s, 10 Type 4 classes, including Class 40s, 41s, 42s, 43s, 44s, 45s, 46s, 47s, 50s, 52s, and two prototypes, and one initial Type 5 class, these being the Class 55 Deltics. Of these, each geographical region of the British Rail Network okay. had different preferences for types of diesel traction, with the Western region preferring the hydraulic classes, including Class 35, 42, and 52, the Midland taking on the extremely heavy diesel-electric Class 40s, as well as Class 44, 45 and 46 peaks, and the Eastern Region adopting the highly powerful but small numbered fleet of 22 Class 55 Deltics. At the same time, reliability for these locomotives, thanks to their many manufacturers and the varied experience of each in building diesel engines, was a mixed bag, with some classes, such as the Class 37, 47 and 55, being very sturdy and robust machines, while the original Class 43 warships were prone to breakdowns, the Class 15 and Class 16 being maintenance heavy and prone to overheating, and the Class 17 Claytons being among the most unreliable diesel engines ever employed in Britain, with an average availability of only 60% due to power plant faults. The result was that, by the end of the 1960s, British Rail was forced to undertake a major rationalisation of its fleet, both due to the pervasive unreliability of many classes, but also the need to create spare parts for individual types of locomotives, with the likes of the Class 15, 16 and 17 being withdrawn by the mid-1970s after only 10 to 15 years of use, while the venerable but non-standard hydraulic fleet of the Western region were all out of service by 1977. The like I said earlier, waste of money. Is this Dr. Beeching? Any failures of the modernization plan ultimately led to the hiring of Richard Beeching. It is. That's what he looks like. IBR, to identify cost I've, I know a, quite a bit about Dr. Beeching also being labeled as the Axeman because he chopped up so much of the rail network to try in a bit to save British Railways from, from going bankrupt. And I know he's a mixed bag and a heavy topic to talk about in terms of British uh, Railways history, so I'm just going to not talk about it. Cutting measures eventually resulting in the initial proposal of the plan to cut back loss-making or needless branch lines being expanded to prune away large swathes of the network under what would be known as the Beeching Axe, exacerbated further by the anti-rail transport minister, Ernest Marples, who held business shares in road-building companies and thus chose to remove hundreds of stations and several mainline routes, such as the Waverley route between Carlisle and Edinburgh and the southwestern mainline between Exeter and Plymouth via Oakhampton, some of which had been proposed for rationalisation by Beeching, but not outright closure. The only success of the modernization plan was the electrification of the southeastern main line and the west coast main line, as well as several suburban routes out of London, with the west coast electrification being delivered in tandem with several classes of 100 mile an hour electric locomotives, ranging from the highly successful class 81, 85 and 86 to small 10 batch prototype class 82s, 83s and 84s, each of which were only created as part of a pilot study into improved electric locomotive design and withdrawn not long afterwards. The electric wires would eventually reach Glasgow in 1974, and were complemented by the improved Class 87 electric locomotives from that year, introducing 110 mile an hour operations between London and Scotland, and among the fastest express passenger trains in the UK. Huh. The legacy of the modernisation plan's failure left a shadow on Britain's railways up to and beyond the privatisation of BR in 1994, which struggled on with a debt that was never fully repaid, while also being laden with costly marshalling yards that saw barely any traffic, hundreds of diesel locomotives that were either surplus to requirement the moment they were built, or were crippled with unreliability, and now operating a significantly rationalised network which left many highly populated towns, such as Dudley, Colville, Aldridge and Newcastle under Lyme, without a direct rail connection. Huh. Essentially, the battle for the modernisation plan was lost long before it was drafted, as, rather than following the trends of European railways to fundamentally rebuild their systems into modern, efficient and fast networks, with new infrastructure and routings, costs were cut wherever and whenever possible, 
opting instead for the same Victorian era track work that had long been rendered obsolete by increasing speeds and frequencies. While it's understandable that such a significant infrastructural challenge could not have been met immediately thanks to the post-war debts weighing down the British government, it was not beyond the scope of reason that these upgrades could have been implemented over time, and that the modernisation plan should instead have been a rolling plan of electrification and infrastructure improvements spanning between 20 and 30 years, rather than what essentially amounted to a costly facelift that failed to fix the comprehensive problems with Britain's railway network. Huh. Is that it? Oh, that's it. Well, I'll just make sure there's nothing else at the end. Okay. So that pretty much answered about half of my questions of what I've already of what I've actually said throughout this entire video. Which makes me wonder. I gotta do a quick Google search. One moment. Okay, so I was doing a little bit of research off screen for a second there to see who, what was the company that took over British Rail's after British Rail was privatized or collapsed. I have to do more research on that. I'm going to do that off screen so I can gain a better understanding of, well, I know wh why it collapsed, but who took over the network after. So with that being said, guys, hopefully you enjoyed today's reaction video and history lesson for British, for um, Britain's rail network. <laughs> Um, I will see you guys in the next video soon, <laughs> whatever is coming out after this. I, my upload schedule is all over the place. Like I have a video come, reaction video coming out one day, a gaming video coming out the next. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just playing it by day right now, but hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.